Everybody, welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence along with our cast of experts, and we're all set to go against the spread as we come down the stretch on the 2024 college football season and head into the second half of the NFL year. We're going to join our cast and members here today on the show. Andy Isco joining us from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas. Tony Mejia, a playbook expert and contributor to the sporting news. And our producer extraordinaire, Greg De Palma. Victor King is off this particular week. He had to take a little doctor visit or so. And Jim Feist promises he'll join us a little bit later in the show. He did that last week. He likes to hop in for the NFL portion of what we're doing. So don't be surprised if we have a visit from Jim Feist a little bit later on in the show. But with that, I want to go around the horn here and check with everybody, check with everybody. And Andy, ask you, how was your week this week? And how's your football season gone so far? Mark, it's, it's been a very good football season, much more so in the NFL than the colleges, which have been sort of like up and down. A few more ups and downs, but uh, a little bit more erratic. The NFL has been uh, fairly consistent. Uh, I have some very interesting matchups this week that I, I think we'll get a chance to talk about. And uh, last week was a very good week, uh, both uh, out of pocket uh, for the, for the uh, customers and in the contests. Very good. Tony Mejia, playbook expert. Sporting News contributor, how have you enjoyed this 2024 football season? I enjoyed it in spurts, Mark, <laughs> like most of us. <laughs> I think uh, college football has been just strange uh, lately. And, I mean, last week it could have gone either way with, with a lot of things. NFL has been more consistent, but it started completely the other way around. The NFL started uh, really poorly for me, and college football was great. So we'll try to mesh those things over the next uh, – couple of weeks that would be lovely that'd be terrific greg de palma prime sports network how are you doing these days doing good you can uh hopefully well i know for sure by next week you can say pro line tv yes uh so yeah we'll be talking more about that but yeah uh it's awesome it's a great time of year college football season two more weeks to go championship weekend and then uh, the playoffs will begin and uh it's going to be awesome so this is what it's all about. It's exactly what it's all about. We just uh, published our newsletter for this week, and it was it was a nutcracker. I have to say that, guys. It was 63 college football games, and I didn't get to bed till 4 o'clock the night it went out and 4 o'clock the night before. And next week, it's 67 college football games. So I had better set my clock back an hour and get ready an hour early next week as opposed to this week. But I love it. That means the college football card is jam-packed with a lot of good matchups, especially as we head down the stretch as we're doing at this portion of the football season here. Uh, and with that, I want to remind our listeners out there about the Playbook Football Newsletter that I just talked about. Uh, you want to be sure to pick up a copy of this year's newsletter because inside this, near, this week's newsletter, I should say, we outline all of the college football teams in their situations and conditions going into this weekend as it is about bowl eligibility, the teams that just clinched, the teams that are looking to clinch, uh, and a lot of information inside of all that. You can pick that up. You can learn a lot of great winning information inside the newsletter as well. Uh, there's only three teams, by the way, guys. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. This is from our midweek uh, newsletter, our statistical newsletter. But there are only three teams in all of college FBS football this year that have outyarded every opponent they've played so far this football season. Uh, it might be a little bit of a surprise, uh, but nonetheless, you can pick up those inside the midweek alert here as well. In the newsletter on the NFL side of things, we talk about an NFL underdog that's in a perfect 10 and 0 against the spread situation in the underdog role they're in this week. You can get it all inside the Playbook Football newsletter. Download it now at playbooksports.com. Do yourself a favor and pick up a copy just in time for the weekend. And with that, let's move over to our college football game of the week. And I hope you guys got my, my mention here. We, we, I was going to do the UCLA Southern Cal game. And at the last minute, I just switched it to Ohio State, Indiana. Andy, Tony, Greg, did you guys get more word about, about the switch or the move? Well, I I'm saw okay. that, that I saw that you had in the script said USC, UCLA. And then below it, you mentioned something about who do you like in the Indiana, Ohio State game. So I thought we were. I can't imagine I that any of us is not prepared to talk about Ohio <laughs> State and Indiana. So don't worry about that, Mark. Well, that's a good point because I thought that exactly when I made that last <laughs> minute switch. <laughs> it's not uh, like you're going. Well, did I did I forget to tell you about that Rice SMU game? 
Yeah, we're, yeah, we're going to go to the uh, Central Michigan Western Michigan matchup, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or one involving Kennesaw State. Yeah, yeah. really, huh? <laughs> But let's do that, guys. It is a huge weekend in college football this weekend. We're just two more games for the regular se- for most of the regular season. We've got obviously the conference championship games coming forward, and then the standard, usual Army Navy game. And before we get into the Ohio State Indiana game, guys, I want to ask you a question. And uh, I was asked this on another show that I do, and I think it's a really perfect topic sub- subject here about whether or not with this new college football playoff system that we have and all of what the college football playoffs and conference championship games mean, are they doing justice to teams that would make it to a conference championship game, lose, and then are booted down or out, and they're penalized for that? Andy, what's your thought on that? I I can see the arguments both ways. Now, of course, there are going to be some conferences, most likely the Big 12 and possibly the ACC, where only the winner of the championship game will get in. But then you'd be talking about in the Big Ten, where you arguably can make the case for Oregon, Ohio State, uh, Penn State, uh, certainly for those three teams. Um, you can make the case in – and Indiana, by the way, the other team that, that we're going to talk about. You can make the case that uh, two of those teams will have, an, uh, will have an opportunity that will not present itself to the loser of the championship game because, uh, let, let's say – Let's say it's – well, we could have a rematch between Ohio State and Indiana, but um, wh- whichever two Lou teams lose don't have to play that extra game. And so the committee will be uh, tasked with the decision of do we uh, penalize the loser of the Big Ten championship game because it finished second in the conference but couldn't win the title, or, or do, uh, do we penalize that team by taking the two teams that didn't play and arguably for that situation were seated third and fourth in the conference – over the team that lost in the championship game. And then you have a similar thing in the SEC where you have five, uh, I think five, possibly even six teams that can make an argument that with only two losses, they are deserving of being in. Uh, I would think it'd be, my preference would still give, um, unless it's a blowout in the championship conference, conference championship game, and even then you might think about it a bit, I would give that runner up, especially if in the bowl rankings prior to the championship game, they were ranked ahead of the team that made it to the championship game and lost. So I I could see it either way. Personally, I would uh, give, well, I was going to, my, my instinctive thing was I would give more weight to the team that did not, that, that did not win the champion that lost in the championship game. But then I, I caught myself and I'm thinking, well, you know what? There are so many or so often tiebreakers involved and teams don't play everybody else because of the large conferences that uh, it's, it's a little bit, I, I'm now finding it. I'm, I'm sort of beating around the bush and saying, I think it's much more difficult than just looking at it on the surface. Cause you can make good arguments either way, but I think both arguments have uh, vulnerabilities. Well, Tony, uh, let me ask you this question. Uh, uh, we saw the perfect example of this last year in the SEC championship game when Georgia played Alabama in the championship yeah. game. Georgia lost, and all of a sudden <laughs> they go from the top-ranked team in the country to out of the playoffs, which I think was an injustice to the absolute max. But there was Georgia paying the price because they took the loss against Alabama at the wrong time of the season. What's your take on that, about uh, losing a football game at the wrong oh, time? By, oh, the by the way, before Tony answers, forget what they also left out unbeaten Florida State. Well, yes, yeah. well, going from four argument. to 12 is the key here. So I don't want to hear it. I generally don't. And the point is we're, we're not trying to fill space here. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a as long as you go type of uh, show here that we that we pull off. So I'm not going to sit here and cry like they did uh, on the selection committee show the other night. The bottom line is, is that there was a lot made about Indiana being five when Indiana should be five at this point. Because once you get to mid-November and you're in the Big Ten, doesn't matter what your conference schedule was. You still played Michigan. Michigan was supposed to be a lot better than it was. You've, you've played these teams. You've beaten them. Uh, and your ranking should be what your ranking is. Now, that being said... We've got a lot of, of games still left to play. Texas will play Texas a and Indiana will play Ohio State this weekend. It'll work itself out. And team number 13, if you're not in, said this all year, a lot of people here have agreed with me, uh, if you're not in, tough. Now, the, the whole Lane Kiffin uh, argument that he's, he's – and I love Lane Kiffin. 
He said, uh, you know, there are a lot of SEC coaches that I've talked to off the record that have said, I'd rather have the bye week than play in the SEC championship. Is that sending the wrong message? Sure. Is that take probably honestly uh, something from a coach's I, perspective? Yeah, right. Yeah, from a coach's perspective that I can respect? Absolutely. Um, because the bottom line is, uh, you want to win it all at the end and you want to have yourself best suited to win a playoff game. Uh, you know, conference uh, championships are great, but uh, the eyes on the prize if you're in the top 12. So I get that argument as well. To go back to, well, should we weigh whoever's in the SEC championship and loses higher than say, so let's, let's for argument's sake, say it, it's not Ole Miss and Ole Miss is sitting there um, at, in, in that argument with the, with the loser of the SEC championship game and the SEC championship game, as you, as you just asked me, Mark, lost at the wrong time. Well, then I would personally give the SEC championship game loser a slight edge on an Ole Miss just for getting and navigating the course. I think yeah, there's going to be differences of opinions there and we'll see. But the, uh, the, my, my, my take on it is it will continue to work itself out. SEC, the ACC championship, I think there are a lot of people uh, balking about BYU and SMU at this point uh, because uh, BYU has the head-to-head -head win and SMU, I believe, is ahead of them at this point. Again, we're going to see what happens once we get to the ACC uh, championship game. And if it's SMU getting there and then ultimately losing to Miami, well, Miami will have earned its spot. And I think... From that standpoint, BYU's head-to-head -head victory would trump SMU losing at the wrong time, quote-unquote. But again, BYU has its game against Arizona State this weekend, and we will find out going forward. Well, if you look at uh, who ends up settling at number 13 in the poll, uh, there are obviously going to be reasons why they finished number 13. There were a couple of chinks in the armor. Something didn't happen. Something didn't go right. You can try and deflect and talk about other things and other reasons, but the fact of the matter is you're number 13 for a reason. Greg, what's your take on this? How do you feel about uh, playing football games? Are they being penalized for having to play in a championship game as opposed to teams that didn't play in a championship game? I don't think they will be. Uh, Ole Miss is an interesting situation that you bring up, Tony, because of the fact that they have two losses. So if they have three, if they lose, then that's going to be a debate. Well, wait a second. Indiana's got one, Ole Miss is three, and you're putting Ole Miss in over Indiana. That's going to be the kind of discussion that we'll have, even though I can't imagine, even if they have three losses, that if they lose that game, that they're not making the playoffs. I, they'll find a way to put Ole Miss in the playoffs. They just can't not have them in the playoffs if they went to the championship game, even if they have three losses. So uh, I agree with just about everything Tony said. Look, bottom line is don't, don't ever care. We said it last year. I don't care about any team that complains at their team. Uh, it was four. Now you have a chance. You got eight other teams. If you can't make it there, then too bad. Look at Tennessee. I mean, that's the team. Everybody wants to talk about Georgia because, wow, well, oh, they're down to nine and they should be at five. Look at Tennessee. I mean, they're not even in it. Uh, Boise's now uh, moved ahead and now knocked Tennessee at 11. Tennessee was 11, not 12. They're 11 and they're out of it because Boise's ahead of BYU, which is kind of weird. Like, why is that Tennessee's fault? So would, I was going to say, would and Tony brought it up. Suppose Ole Miss loses the championship game in the SEC. It would be their third loss. Let's say it's a one-sided loss, like a 37-13. No, even, with, even with three losses, you'd have them in there. How can you put any other SEC team ahead of Ole Miss if they went to the championship game? You can't do it. Well, if no, well, it would be because of tiebreakers. Let's say they, they, they could be four or five teams with two losses facing. No, no I know uh, that. I'm just saying, yeah. if they're in the championship game, doesn't that mean that those are the two best teams in the conference? No, not at all. Because well, you don't play it. No, I'll tell you what. Well, we'll get to it when we talk about Indiana, Ohio State. But when you take a look at the number of teams, 16 teams in the conference, you can't play everybody and you lose out on, on tiebreakers because you didn't get a chance to play. Uh, or you got the Mississippi didn't have to play some of the better teams in the conference. And had they been able to play the same teams that, let's say, an LSU played, maybe they wouldn't have had, maybe they would have had more than two losses because, because had they all played the same schedule, like they pretty much did before all this conference, these conferences expanded, I could agree with that. But when you're, when well, you're, who would you, who would you put ahead of them right now? 
let's just say they lose the championship game. Give me a team that you would say that team maybe has a right to be ahead of Ole Miss and therefore knock Ole Miss out of the playoffs. Alabama? I, I Alabama should be in, and I'm sure they would be in. Okay. Possibly Tennessee? No. They can leave. Texas or te- whoever loses between Texas, Texas and leave. Texas AM. If they got two losses, Texas can leave. They haven't played anybody. Well, really, in truth, the they, A&M hasn't played a lot either. But go ahead, guys. I don't want to interrupt the conversation. Who did, well, who did Mississippi play? Well, they just beat up on Georgia. Okay. And that's a team that a lot of people are going to say, look, I'm not Georgia's backer, that's for sure. Uh, and this is the thing. I just – I think SEC – look, we all know the SEC is the best conference in college football. But I just think they're being oh. overrated. I, I've said it all year. I just don't – I think there's too much parity in college football. And I know it's going to take time for the experts to catch up to that because they're so used to the power conferences being the best teams. But this transfer portal has changed everything instantaneously. Overnight, they've changed it. Just look at Indiana as an example. And I think they've got it. Look, I went over, I did a video earlier because I I, I maybe even referenced the uh, uh, show you were talking about, Tony. Paul Feinbaum and Russo and Stephen A. Smith all defending Georgia and Mad Dog saying Georgia is the second best team in college football. I mean, get with it. Are you watching Georgia play football? Well, I mean, all, all I went over- those, those guys outside of Feinbaum who lives and breathes college football, I, I don't trust their opinions whatsoever. And Feinbaum is the biggest SEC cheerleader you got. Yeah. So, How- but, and we have this conversation every single year, and I, we're having it now, but I refuse to have it. Uh, I, I, I'm fine with having it now. I refuse to have it once these rankings are set in stone. I we're agree. Have Texas, Texas A&M. Yeah. Like, but remember, these it, rankings are opinions. Right. I, but, but at the same time, th- there's a lot of factors that go into those opinions. And look, here's, here's the deal with A&M. If A&M beats Texas, wonderful. And then Texas has to uh, uh, you know, really say, all right, well, do we hold up? Does our resume hold up? If Texas A&M loses, then Texas A&M has lost to Notre Dame, and Texas A&M has lost to Texas, and Texas A&M is in trouble. Uh, you know the, the the thing with Tennessee, same thing. I was a huge on Tennessee at the beginning of the season. They just lost to Georgia. They were up ten nothing in that game. They hold on and beat Georgia. They're part. They're they're not part of this conversation. It's almost like, yay, yeah, salute Tennessee. You're in. Good yep. job. Yep. Th- that's that's where I'm at with all this. And again, you've got a, a Notre Dame with a head-to-head win over Texas A&M. You've got other schools you, 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 that that have dropped the ball in the SEC. You can't just say like you do every year that the SEC is the deepest conference because yes, the SEC is the deepest conference. The Big Ten isn't as, as sturdy as we thought this se- this season, but Indiana's rise, uh, especially if they play well against Ohio State this weekend, looks uh, will we'll, we'll make the conference look as it normally does with a Penn State in the mix and the Buckeyes where they're supposed to be. With, where, with you only know, can drop it off. With only four power conferences now, I would argue that the top four or five teams in the SEC would be favored to win the Big 12 and the ACC, not the Big 10, because Oregon and Ohio State. But I would say they'd be favored to win those to, to be the champions of the other two. Would not argue with you on that, but again, we can't. We with 12 teams, we can't say, oh, because Tennessee was supposed to beat SMU, maybe by 10 or 12 or 14, depending on whose power numbers you look at. The fact that they don't play in that league, the fact that there is a Miami and SMU in that league, in addition to a Clemson, uh, it, it just is what it is. It's a numbers game, and the SEC happens to be the strongest conference. I'll, I'll agree with that. Should the by SEC... the way, let me let me ask a quick question. Other than Texas A and M, who's Notre Dame played this year? Oh, they haven't played to the schedule they, either. Matter Northern Illinois. Yeah, they 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 they're they're, they're going to get a boost from the fact that Army is undefeated. Good for them. Good. Yes. But, it, it, but again, it is it, it is what it is. And it had yeah. had they lost to Texas A and M, then they're not in this conversation. Well, I, I don't, and 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 I have no problem with A and M. Uh, excuse me, Notre Dame being in the playoff if they run the table. The only thing is, let's keep in mind uh, they've only played to this point two true road games. Two, they will play their third one, the last game of the season at USC. So they they do actually have two of their toughest games coming up. So if they can win these two, I have no problem putting Notre Dame in with one loss. I think they deserve to be up there. They have one of the best defenses in college football. I'm okay with that. Well, the the defenses in college football were uh, against teams at home, which, by the way, was where they lost their only game, and against teams that don't have the kind of offenses that these other leading teams have. 
Well, okay, but, they, but they've got the name of Notre Dame. I want to see Ole Miss beat Florida. I want to see Ole Miss win the Egg Bowl like they're supposed to. True. And yeah. that, to me, it, it, good good for Lane Kiffin. Ole Miss. He makes the SEC because because that went over Georgia. It speaks volumes to me. If Georgia yeah. had not handled uh, Tennessee this weekend, then then they have nothing to, to complain about. By, by so, the way, that win over Georgia may have said more about Georgia than it did about Ole Miss. Although Ole Miss is an outstanding team, deserved to be favored and deserved to win that game. But I think that that yeah. that was just a further exclamation point for all those people who are saying Georgia's the number two team in the country. Right. Hey guys, I'm going to go. Guys, I'm going to go on my record. My positions are, are crazy because yes, on paper I had Georgia number one in the country by a lot. I, I, I'm not, I haven't been as big an Ohio State person as, as a lot of people. I like Oregon. On, pay, on paper, the Cleveland Browns are not a 2-8 and eight team. Yeah, exactly. So, And we can't play these games on paper, especially yeah. with 12 spots. 12 spots. If you're, if you're not in with 12 spots, clearly, then you have no beat. Let me say this, guys. Uh, I'm going to go on record and say this, that uh, should Notre Dame run the table, finish with one loss, and not make the top four in the college football rankings, it will be time for Notre Dame to join a conference affiliation. It's the schedule that's going to kill this football team here. They're not in any part of the power four conferences, which is where all that what they want all these teams to be playing in amongst and fighting each and every week in amongst. Yeah. Not taking out. We are ultimately out. going to see, and I said this about 15 years ago, four major conferences, 16 teams each for a nice field of 64. They will have quarterfinal games, semifinal games, and a championship game, and that'll be a true national playoff. Of course, the only thing that that – that uh, is a little fly in the ointment here is what do you do with Notre Dame? They'd have to, they'd have to kick somebody out of those 16 team conferences for Notre Dame to fit in there, unless they are okay with an 18 team conference. But yeah, I and, think you're right. One, but one thing about the Irish this year, thank goodness for them that army is, is, is doing what Having it's doing. But FSU was supposed to be a top five team. And so it, it, you can't penalize Notre Dame because Florida State fell off as significantly as they can have, or, or that Louisville who's, who's on their schedule as well, lost a, a bunch of tight games that they could have won to raise their national profile. I mean, that, that's why I'm an advocate of you play the schedule that you're in front of. And that's why the whole Indiana backlash to me is, is ridiculous. Like you're, you're, you're going to penalize an Indiana team that yes, they stumbled against Michigan and they haven't really beaten anybody of significance, but they're undefeated on November 21st. I mean, and and, Andy, and it, your point, Andy, about, uh, if like Ole Miss were to get blown out, I'd look at more of Indiana if they get blown out. Because if Ohio State blows out Indiana, they're not getting in. Matter of fact, they're probably not even getting in if they lose. But should they get in and lose a game in overtime, last second field goal on the road to Ohio State, beat Purdue, which they will the next week, their only loss, closing seconds to Ohio State, they probably deserve to get in and they might get in, but if they get blown out by Ohio state and it's their only loss on the season, no way they make the playoffs. I agree. I agree. You know, another interesting point here, guys, but we, we, we got to get to the Ohio state, Indiana game. Uh, but uh, one other note of interest that uh, it was a text that was out there, a tweet. It was in fact. Uh, and I thought it was really quite interesting about uh, there's only 13 teams that are ranked in the AP rankings right now that, are currently ranked, and none of them has a win against any of the 13 teams. You look at the teams are Texas, Indiana, Miami, SMU, A&M, Colorado, Clemson, Army, Tulane, Arizona State, UNLV, Illinois, and Washington State. None of them have beat an AP-ranked football team this year. Now, that's going to change here, obviously, because Texas is going to play Texas A&M. Indiana is going to play Ohio State. Doesn't mean Indiana's going to win this football game, but the, you know they're going to play them. Or the Indiana may stay on this list. Arizona uh, State's going to play BYU. Yeah, but they have to beat them to come off this list. You know that's yeah, that's the thing. They're going to get the chance, though. Yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll get the chance to do just that. So uh, that's all leading to my question: Is will there be a team in the top four that will be on this list? This list that is left, a top four team in the college football playoffs that has zero wins against ranked teams this year. Will there be a, such a team? Does Miami, I guess Miami can do that, right? Because Miami can do that. Uh, uh, you know, will Miami play Clemson in the 
ACC championship nope. game? No, no. It's going to be Miami SMU. Right. So they then they can't do that. Okay. So Miami will be left alone by themselves. Uh, Clemson, they're going to play SMU. Those two teams are on the list. So one of those two is going to win that football game. But it'll be interesting to see how many of these 13 teams and what it whittles down to. I'm going to say probably eight teams will end up on in the season here with zero wins against ranked football teams. And, and, and by the way, and, and again, keep in mind though, I'm not, I shouldn't have said that because I am willing to give Virginia a chance to knock off SMU this week. Uh, and if that happens, then Clemson, I guess then has a shot uh, to take on Miami in the championship game. So that could happen. Um, you know, SMU's vulnerable. We, we've seen it. They've uh, they've had a couple of games this year where you scratch your head. Uh, so, um, so yeah. So, I, I don't want to just uh, give SMU the ACC championship game, but it looks pretty good for Miami. That's for also, sure. Also, Mark, did you say that Texas and Texas A&M are both on that list? Yes. Because I believe – that the winner of the Texas Texas A and M, assuming the, and we don't want to assume because it's going to be a tough game for all, for uh, uh, for for A and M this week against all, at Auburn, and you know Kentucky could put up a fight against Texas. But assuming that both A and M and Texas win, the winner of that game next week goes to the uh, SEC championship game, and the loser is out. So tough one loss, of the, te- Texas or Texas A and M will have one of those wins. Uh, and if they win the uh, SEC championship game, then they might be one of those top four teams. And the guy that's out Especially will be another two lost team. Yeah. Well, let's get into it, guys. Let's tear down this Ohio State Indiana football matchup here, and uh, you know a lot of pros and cons. Ohio State, the big bad Buckeyes, Indiana, the new kids in the block haven't played anybody that's credible, or at least so say the pundits. I'm going to start out with you, Tony. What do you think happens in this Ohio State Indiana game, and who do you like? Well, I, I don't think Ohio State is glaringly better than Indiana. So I, I favor them. I think it's very good for Indiana that the Buckeyes have lost their starting center for the remainder of the, of the season uh, and just happened to face the Hoosiers right out of the gate with a brand new center. And luckily for, for Ohio State that this happens in a home game because if it was on the road, uh, that would definitely cause major issues because the mechanics of an offensive line and a, a QB center, or you know, I don't have to explain it to you guys, but to our audience, maybe it, it, it's something that I look at. If I see a, a starting center is down, that's the key to an offensive line, and you're on the road, I'm immediately going against you. Um, cool. but th- this is a home game. We'll see what the Hoosiers are able to do pressure wise. Will Howard's been okay this season, uh, he, he hasn't really. He, he, taking off the way I, I imagined he would. Uh, certainly, this is the skill position-wise, the best team Indiana has faced by far. Uh, maybe Maryland and uh, Washington would hold a candle to that, but not the, with the depth Ohio State can bring to the table. So, sure. Uh, and, and it's also going to be uh, you know, a testament to how prepared Kurt Signetti and his staff get a football team. And I heard it said over the weekend that the closest thing to Nick Saban in college football now that Saban has retired is Kurt Signetti. And results-wise, I would argue with that. But, again, dude on the big stage, dude in this game, I'm as curious as anybody to see whether it can happen. But I don't automatically dismiss uh, Indiana's chances to win this game so long as Rourke is close to, because he's not 100%, closer, closer to 90% than 70%. So uh, I think Indiana does have depth in the backfield. You get a well-placed turnover in the in the red zone or to create a short field situation, and all of a sudden you've got seven points to work with that you wouldn't ordinarily have, and it becomes a football game. And I, I certainly am with Greg that, like I, I, like I said before, Oregon and Boise State way back when, I said if Boise State is in this football game, there's your, there's your group of five representative in this DFP. Haven't been proven wrong there. And I think if Indiana can just hang around here and it's a seven point game with five minutes to go, it's going to go a long way uh, in, in terms of national uh, rep. Well, Andy, uh, your take on this game. And before we get there, I got to ask you guys a question. Uh, bring me up to speed here. Is it mandatory that the committee chooses a group of five team to make the college football playoff or do they have to be in their tw- top 12 ranking? I believe yeah. uh, they've committed 
one yep. one of the twelve spots to a non power four conference team. The uh, question other is going to be how about this Notre one? Dame? How about this one? What happens if Army beats Notre Dame and Boise State has been everybody's since darling definitely they almost beat Oregon they're going to be the to they're going to be the group of five team and what if army wins the game two what words do you think is going to be next two week lane. two lane <laughs> watch out for Tulane well yeah but Tulane unfortunately well we we all love Tulane the problem is is that unfortunately i don't think they're going to be able to catch those teams so what do you think no, i, I do, thought do you, you were going to suggest that army is ahead of uh Boise State or they're still behind Boise State well, you, by that, by that, by that rationale, you're saying that Army beats Notre Dame and Army beats Tulane. What's that? Right. Well, then, yeah, Boise State is uh, in a world of trouble. Okay. Yeah. But what do you think? Do you, do you think that they'll put Army ahead of Boise if they win? Oh, absolutely. If, if those, if, if Army beats Notre Dame and Army beats Tulane, I think strength of schedule wise, they top Boise. Okay. And I guess the other thing that is, and Andy's point is, is if Tulane then beats army then who the heck knows what they're going to do but i agree Andy. i, would, I, would I hope it, if it's Tulane, it's Tulane. and they could have a, a rematch in the uh, championship game army and Tulane. no that, that is they don't play each other it would be the championship game. i thought i thought it's a regular season finale for uh, no, I thought they, no 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 yeah. well andy where do you where do you think we go in this football game here uh indiana ohio state uh what is andy isco looking at well Power ratings suggest this should be a competitive game. In fact, my power ratings actually have uh, Indiana as the team that has gained the most from the preseason power ratings to the current. They were right up there with South Carolina and Vanderbilt, and they've now uh, extended that uh, that advantage. So uh, purely based on the number. Now, a lot of that does have to do with the schedule that Indiana has played. Um you know, no Ohio State, no Penn State. Well, no Ohio State till this week. No Penn State, no Oregon. Okay. My concern for Indiana is a couple of concerns. Number one, Singretti's done a great job. He's, you know, you can you don't even need to mail in the ballots. He's coach of the year. I don't know if it'll be unanimous, but it should be very close to it. Uh, of course, he brought some of his James Madison players over with him, and the fact is that those by going to James Madison. That also tells you the kind of recruiting that he was able to do uh, and the fact that the players, although they've been great, they may have not been recruited by some of these larger teams, whereas Ohio State recruits, you know, the nation for you know, first, second, third string players that could probably play for 90 percent of the teams outside of the you know top 20, let's say. The concern I have fundamentally is Indiana's really not been tested this year. Ohio State has been tested twice and in their two biggest games. And in fact, they could have beaten Oregon, except for some uh, um, kicking woes that they had in that game. And then, of course, they were given a contest for a good part of the game against Penn State. We don't know how Indiana will react in a close game because they haven't been in a close game. And there's something to be said with that. You know, who's the who's the pressure on in this game? It's probably more on Indiana than it is Ohio State. Although a loss by Ohio State could certainly muck things up as far as the Big uh, uh, the Big Ten championship game were they to lose it. Although I don't expect that. To, although Oregon could beat them a second time. Um, well, they they actually handled the pressure pretty well late against Michigan. I mean, they uh, they, they, they were in a game they should not. Yeah, have but been let's, in. Re let's let's remember this is a Michigan team that's not a Michigan team. They lost no, I'm just an awful lot. They, they felt but, pressure, yeah. so they handled yeah. the pressure. Yeah, I, I, I'll give them credit for that. Sure. Uh, I'm just I'm just concerned about the athletes on Ohio State being able to wear down, especially at home, um, Indiana in the second half. Now, maybe you know, maybe uh, I lean somewhat to you know, I'm, I'm not going to say it's a, equivalent to Notre Dame against Navy. Uh, there's a class and talent there, but we saw uh, the edge that Notre Dame had, and we may see it against Army. I'm not quite sure there, although I see it's funny because I do. I don't know they're going to play the games, but I do like Army plus the points. I like Ohio State minus the points because I just think uh, Army can do some things against Notre Dame that most teams can't because they can run the ball for eight minutes, and if they don't score, that's maybe two possessions that each side doesn't have the rest of the game. Uh, I'm just wondering if Ohio State won't wear down Indiana. I think for college football, it'd be great to see Indiana maybe even upset Ohio State. I'm just not sure it's going to happen. I can't play that game because I want to play Indiana – the numbers say Indiana, but when I compare the two schedules and the two rosters, I find it difficult. I think Indiana will be competitive for a while, 
but I'm not quite sure happens in the third quarter. Greg, what do you see happening here, Greg, in this football game? Yeah, I, I can actually see exactly what Andy's saying. It makes a lot of sense. But I think one advantage, a couple of advantages that will help Indiana is, is that we heard, of course, this week that Ohio State centers out for the year. They lost their left tackle for the year about a month ago. So they have two of their best linemen not playing in this game. And again, this is not the Ohio State from two, three, four years ago because – you just can't replenish the roster. Those guys are on other teams. Uh, you try to, but, you know, the, you know, the backups are better than other back backups. I give them that, but they're not superstars. So there'll be a drop a little bit. That should help Indiana there. I also think it's going to be helpful. I, I, I really believe Indiana might be better off on the road uh, because there's no pressure on them now. None at all. Even though they're undefeated, everybody's expecting them to lose. The line's gone up. Um, you know, Indiana, come on, what they, they haven't been whether oh for the last 29 against Ohio State. So come on, nobody's expecting this. There are some people like Andy agree. All right, maybe Indiana give them a chance. They're, they're playing great, they can do it. But I, I I'm just gonna stick with this all year until I'm proven wrong by the end of the season. I, I think you could put a uh 15, 20 of these teams in a hat, throw it up, and I think anybody can beat anybody. I think that's the kind let's, of season it is. And so, therefore, I think Indiana is one of those plays that we often talk about, Mark. That hey, you know what? I'm willing to I'm willing to put money on the double digit money line play because I think they can win. I'm not going to sit here and predict they're going to win, but I think they can win. And not okay, yeah, game where if, if they win. do win, you're not going to be stunned, is what it is, right? Yeah, and it's what and and I just I'm not. I, I think if they win, it's not going to surprise me in the least because I'm not enthralled with this Ohio State team. I don't think they're anything much better than Indiana. I just don't. Let yeah, me let me ask you this question, and maybe you or Tony, you both you both alluded to it, and it's an important point. The uh, the two offensive linemen who are out for the year, and I don't know if you're able to track this. How much play, considering Ohio State was in a lot of one sided games where they often empty the bench. How much playing time did both of the individuals who'll be playing those positions this week seen throughout the season? Yeah, I would imagine that Ohio State center has seen action. I, I mean, I don't know. Some, well, you you have to look into that. Um, you know, right before the kickoff, but I would assume that the tackle's been playing for the last month because yeah. uh, that that switch has been made. But as far as the center, I'm sure he has seen action. So well, they've got to be comfortable with this. My take, though, and I'm in agreement with Greg, this is not an Ohio State super team. I just don't believe that there is a super team like a Georgia uh, that went unbeaten for you know years on end this season in in college football. Ohio State has already let ready lost to Oregon. Iowa isn't what Iowa used to be defensively. Ohio State's beat them. Ohio State has beat Penn State. Those are the three teams on, on Ohio State's schedule. That you can say, wow, they, they've stood head to toe with heavyweights. And Indiana, you know, quote unquote, has Michigan. That Michigan defense did get some players back. They were without their star corner. Uh, but that's a, that's a top 15 talent-wise college football defense that Indiana beat. And they pulled, some, they pulled some stuff back, too, because they had control of that game. They could have won that game by double digits if they're playing that uh, with, with uh, the need for style points. And style points, by the way, just as an aside, come into play over the next couple of weeks uh, for teams like SMU. SMU ran the score up the other day. I don't know if you guys saw that scoring with like 10 seconds left or something on a pass when they absolutely need to, just because I, I, I would assume that they feel they, they have to from a ranking standpoint. That or they're watching Penn State films, you know. Let me let me I ask this question. Forget, they, they barely survived Nebraska at home yeah. about a month ago. Well, that was, I think, the uh, Penn State-Oregon sandwich, wasn't it? They still barely survived well, Nebraska a let month me, ago. Let, You're right. Well, you know, but, the old, the old, an, an old Ohio State team, sandwich or not, well, let, blown, let me, let me ask you as a side, sidebar here. Which team has regressed more from what we've seen the last few years, Ohio State or Georgia, based on this year's performance and what we've seen the last few years? Georgia. Well, you're talking about a two-loss Georgia team and a, a one-loss Ohio State team. I think the answer might be in the math there. You know. No. And, and, and look, I, I think I think it boils down to the talent that Georgia has lost. I mean, you had first round the Philadelphia Eagles defense is mostly uh, Georgia offensive linemen, uh, defensive linemen. And then you've got guys like Brock Bowers that you can't rely on anymore. McConkie's lining it up in the NFL as a rookie. Uh, Carson Beck hasn't been 
what even uh, his predecessor was, even though his predecessor is is. is... Uh, Tony uh, thought think... he might uh, yeah. have to. Come I think back I, I think part of he's talking. part of Beck's performance is related to guys like Bowers and McConkie, who he's lost yeah. uh, well, from last you know year. What? That's got a lot to do with it. And that's going to happen. That's why. See, this is why it's funny when these guys have these great college careers, and then everybody wonders when they go into the NFL why they struggle early. This is exactly why, yeah. because the guys like the Brock Bowers and you know these other superstar players like McConkie aren't there. They're with you know mediocre to bad NFL teams, and they struggle. So Beck was just facing it, I guess, in his college, his last college season, but still. It doesn't excuse the fact that he's thrown 12 interceptions. I mean, he has no. not looked good uh, whatsoever, um, and uh, that is a big uh, issue potentially. Tony, Georgia's you were defense, saying? Georgia's defense is fairly solid. You know, It's not as dominant the last year, but, yeah, Georgia's weakness this year has been on the offensive side of the football. Yeah, and, and, and Georgia's defense was elite uh, for a couple of years there, You know, both, yeah. both from an execution and talent level. And I, it just – it's been it's been uh, not as uh, dominant this season. Well, guys, let me let's put the wrap on this because we want to move over to our NFL game of the weekend. When we do that, Jim Feist is going to join us from Las Vegas with some NFL commentary as well. The way I look at this Indiana Ohio State game is, uh, you know, I'm from Ohio. I would love to see the Buckeyes win, but I don't ever bet with my heart. I can't do that. Uh, what do I see in the Indiana Hoosiers this year? I love the statement that. Tony refers to you, you, you beat who's in front of you. Yeah. You, know, you don't worry about how, how they got there, what they did. You beat whoever's in front of you. And Indian has done that soundly all football season here. One great stat about Signetti that I came across here, uh, aside from in his career, he's played 11 conference games in the road. He's cashed in 10 of those when he's undefeated and he has the better record, his football teams, they are 21 and two straight up and 16-5 and five to the spread. And remember this, Indiana just held in their last two football games, both Michigan and Michigan State, to season-low yardage in both of those football games. It's not like it was we're talking about Purdue uh, or two bad football teams. Both of those teams could be bowling this football season here, but that's a pretty strong accomplishment for that Indiana defense. Season-low yardage marks to Michigan and Michigan State. I'll be taking the points in this football game. And by right, the way, keep an eye on the fact that Signetti, and I think he's a great coach, I really do, but let's just keep an eye on the fact that, as you guys have referenced, he brought a lot, not just James Madison guys over, he brought every good James Madison player over that had all conference accolades with the exception of the quarterback, which he didn't need because he already had the max best quarterback. So very good coach, but it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of years when he can't pull that trick anymore. So he also brought a lot of the coaching staff with him as well. And, you know, they when when you come from a breed like that where all you do is win, it's kind of a good start, kind of a, a good uh, tool to have to begin with when uh, you're surrounded yourself by nothing but winners. Yeah. By, the, by the way, let me point out one thing about Ohio State, Indiana, for some people who might be interested. Common opponents this year, there were three of them. They were both 3-0. and Ohio, Indiana outscored those three opponents by 34 points per game. Ohio State by barely 20 points per game. So if you want, and that's, you know, that's a third of the schedule basically that they've uh, pretty much played to date. So Indiana does stack up well statistically against the teams that both they and Ohio State played. Good point, Andy. Real good point. Okay, guys, let's get it over to the National Football League side of things. And I know uh, Greg's going to reach out to Jim Feist. Uh, just a quick update while he's reaching out here, only because we've been on this topic for a month now. And I'm going to probably end it here after this, but we were talking about it the hole that NFL home underdogs fell into and it looked like a cavern they would never come out of. Well, guess what? They bounced back NFL home underdogs. Uh, they're 25 and 35 and two to the spread this year. And they were really disastrous before. Uh, so that's just kind of keeps you in, in touch and form there. So don't be shying away from home dogs because you think they're having a horrible football season here. And Andy, before we turn it over to the Lions and the Colts for our NFL featured game of the week, uh, is there any word you heard about the Survivor Contest? I was talking with Paul Bovey on another show earlier this year. Oh, there's two of the entries that are left. And I asked him, I asked him, uh, is he, would, would he consider selling any of those entries? And if so, for what? 
And his answer to me was, no, absolutely not. He would not sell them. And I, I, he said, primarily because the money doesn't mean anything to him. Uh, it's, it's more going for the brass ring than it is taking a small piece of the prize. Each ticket right now, I think he told me, Andy, was worth about $140,000. Have you heard that? I've, yeah, I've got that. By the way, let me just say something about the, the home underdogs and something to keep in mind because we always talk about who teams play. It's also when you play certain, how certain games are scheduled so that sometimes there are more mismatches that turn out earlier in the year than late in the year and vice versa. So it's important to, within the context of why underdogs may have bounced back as the schedule may have been more conducive for home underdogs as lines have adjusted throughout the year than at the beginning because of it's, uh, it's not necessarily who you play, but when you play them. As far as the Circus Survivor contest goes, yes, uh, there were 105 out of the 14,266 entries to start the season. All but 105 were eliminated heading into week 11. Uh, the, most two, the two most popular teams last week uh, of the 105, 65 of them were split, 34 on the Lions, 31 on the Dolphins. The Packers and the Vikings also both won. They each had 11. But there were two teams that lost. Two people inexplicably, I believe, had the Browns in their game at uh, at, at New Orleans. And that <laughs> the Browns? Lost. The Browns against the Saints, yes. Um, I wasn't sure. I, could, I wasn't understanding why people no, like the Browns. I would have uh, been one of those points in that one. But... Um, uh, the 49ers also in their upset, the late upset loss to Seattle had four. So six were eliminated. There are 99 remaining. And for those of us who, who, who would like to have been there or are in there and, and might want to be able to use the money, each ticket is now worth $144,101. But 99 wow. is left. Wow. Real nice. Real nice. That's a 144 to 1 payback, 143 to 1 payback on your $1,000 entry fee. And, and that big wow that I heard sounds like Jim Feist from Las Vegas. I, Jim, how, how are you doing these days? I'm doing good. I did a show with Paul this morning, and uh, he is still alive with two entries. God bless him. And uh, I told him in the beginning, he had a bunch of entries. I told him he's the favorite. And I, I'm, I'm, so far, he's still there. <laughs> I want to well, see does does anybody have more than two entries, or is, is the, I, think, the I, I believe there's one person that has six. I may make him the favorite, no. Jim. <laughs> nah, no, they can't beat Paul. Paul. Paul's too good. You can't beat him. <laughs> you know this guy right here. I think you know this guy. I, I don't have my visual on in front of me here right that's, now, Jim. That's, that's, is that Ken Thompson? Yes. Wednesday nights. Let's go, Mark Lawrence. Ten years on that show. Hey Kenny, how you doing, bud? We Kenny, just we just did with Feist we, at Dom DeMarco's out here. Yeah, Forget we just did a show, and Andy, Andy, I uh, want you to be on as soon as you can. You yeah. can get free. Andy's probably the, to, probably yeah, the yeah, Thursday after is. Thanksgiving. And, here, and here's the owner right here, Albert. I know Albert I Scott. say you some stuff. We're trying to get you on here, Andy. Come on, Isco. You can I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Push. How about two weeks? Okay. Week right. week after Thanksgiving. Okay. You and he'll, want, for, he'll want his pizza a certain way. I, I, I was guarantee just going to say, I have a craving for some believe pizza. Me. But, but, believe me, look at this food. Sure. This is incredible. I got the large pizza, yeah. baby, Andy. It's phenomenal. Yeah, we're having fun. I've had their pizza before. It is delicious. Oh, some good. secret ingredient must be being used. It is definitely Albert's secret ingredient. <laughs> I'm just hanging out with the legend over here. So, you know. Awesome. Well, well, that's what he said. That's what Jim America. said about hanging out with you, Ken. Yeah. But yeah, well, you got to hop on our show uh, a little bit between either. now and the end of the season, I, Kenny. Love to have you aboard. Uh, you guys are the best. I, awesome. I was never, I was never going to be the lead in white white man can't jump. It was him. <laughs> oh, he's told you that story. He did tell me. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, let's uh, let's shuffle over to a business here, and the business would be at hand. Our National Football League game of the week we got on tap today. And uh, this National Football League card, it was very difficult zeroing in on the game of the week. And the reason it was difficult is there's only one game playing this week that is a matchup of two teams that have winning records. And I, I think that's part of the pathetic condition the National Football League is in these days. Uh, is it parity? Is it injuries? Is it dilution? I don't know what it is, but it's, it's very, very disturbing to people that love National Football League, love handicapping it, and don't have a lot to work with. So. I think I think Mark, what it is, it's sort of like society in general. The middle class 
is the largest contingent. And then there are some really, really good teams and some really, really bad teams. <laughs> There's 10 teams, and I had a listen to my did a, a little TikTok on it earlier. There's 10 teams that really legitimately could be tanking. I don't believe that's the case, but I do believe that maybe six of them are. And, and you could name them, and you get two or three victories already, and they get nothing to play for. And they just want to get some draft choices and stuff. But, I mean, I do think the Patriots are still playing. I think the Bears are still playing. But but there's some teams that look like they've absolutely quit. And I cannot remember in the six decades I've been doing this where I could actually say that. that there's this early. So teams, it's, it's a horrible – I mean, there's some of the teams at the top, but there are very, very good teams. But it's really amazing that the bottom has just fallen off. It's almost like a, it's like a race to the bottom. There's actually odds up of who's going to be the lowest winning team win-wise. There's actually odds for that now on, on six or eight teams. Well, you might think some might be tanking for the National Football League draft, but I don't think there's any one player in this draft that's worth tanking for. And I don't, I don't well, think not, players tank. Not, I think it it's organizations that tank. It may not be a quarterback they might be a lineman or, you know, there's, there's other good players besides quarterbacks. Well, tra Travis Hunter, Travis Hunter right now looks like he could be the top pick in the draft because yep. he's just such a unique player. Uh, probably going to win the Heisman. Uh, anytime you can get a hold of a player that can play uh, either wide receiver or corner at a very high level, uh, it's a guy that uh, very, very well might end up at the top pick, but is, you know, is he that type of player that, uh, you know, he is a corner or a wide receiver, so it's usually not the spot that uh, gets the number one overall pick. Who's the top offensive lineman? Uh, there's a kid out of LSU, uh, Will Campbell. I think he's pretty much the heads, uh, heads above the number one guy, but uh, is there a, you know, a generational guy there? No. I know, I, that kid at Texas is brilliant, but he's – He's young. Yeah, he's a, he's a top, he's a top uh, three or four tackle. Absolutely. He's up there. Okay, guys. Uh, I'm, Tony, I'm going to throw it over to you on this football game here. Uh, how do you see this shaking out? The Colts, uh, when they take on the Lions, uh, is it asking too much for Detroit to smash another football team? Or can the Colts? <laughs> <laughs> can the Colts match yards and points with the Lions? What's your take, Tony? It's it's never too much to ask uh, an NFL team to do with stuff. Now, look, I, I think my my freebie or whatever my take on this, the prevailing take, would be uh, back Anthony Richardson's rushing yardage in this game because he may be running for his life, first of all. And secondly, we have seen uh, guys like Baker Mayfield and Mason Rudolph even find the end zone against Detroit. Um, the, the, play, the the guys in their division that they played, Gordon Love doesn't look really look to run. C.J. Stroud didn't look to run against uh, the Lions in the Sunday night game that they played. So the, if you look at yards per carry from quarterbacks that have scrambled, some guys have had more tests. And since Richardson got back and got – he uh, regained his job. He has looked to run often. I think they've come off of their uh, treating with kid gloves thing that they had earlier in the year. So I think from that standpoint, he's he's going to be uh, offers a look to Detroit that they haven't really had to to deal with defensively in terms of spying and doing that, which could create opportunities for the Lions to potentially backdoor cover. But I would either lay the points with Detroit or not touch this at all. And certainly, I think the Colts defense has actually performed better than I anticipated they would. But this is a different animal when Jared Goff plays like uh, Jared Goff can. I mean, he, he's had a couple of games where he sees ghosts and throws the ball to the other team or, or just misfires. But if him and St. Brown get going early, that's the key to that offense. And certainly in the red zone, uh, the, the the fact that they can beat you in so many ways. Laporta, I think, is healthy enough to play. He was just questionable last week, but uh, is good to go here. Uh, I, I think the, the, the Lions are in good shape to get the job done and beat another team by double digits. Jim, how do you see this game shaking out, uh, this game between the Colts and the Lions? Are you going to back the chalk or are you going to make a case for the dog here? I, I already bet the dog. Uh, I actually took eight. Um, and, and the reason is this, I just think that, I mean, the Lions, I think, are the best, right now, the best team in football at the moment. They're definitely playing incredible. Now they beat 
teams up like last week, and obviously that that you can't measure it just off that one game. But they their defense has been strong for weeks. Their offense is incredible. Goff has been very efficient. They can run the ball, but they do have some defensive. You know, they had to bring in one player to replace Hutchinson, and then and then they had another injury last week on defense. So the, there's going to be some attrition here, and the teams reach peaks and valleys all the time. Uh, Richardson comes back in. He looked better last week after the two weeks sit down after he tapped out being tired. But and and I think your Colts are going to give him a battle. Now, can they on, on any given day? Anybody can beat anybody. And I mean, the Colts are not a bottom. They're not one of those bottom ten teams. They they definitely can play. It, that's a lot of points to give up on the road after a big victory like that. And I think there's some trends that'll say when the team wins by that much and scores that much, they don't do all that well the next week, especially if they're road favorite. So I'm on the dog in that spot. I agree with you, Jim. Uh, you know, I look at uh, a little bit differently is I see another perfect game from Jared Goff last week. He threw that perfect passer rating game last week. And I like to fade quarterbacks the next week because a law of averages – you know, tells me, does he have two in a row in him? I doubt that. I really do. He's second in quarterback rating this year to Lamar Jackson. Uh, you know, we can't throw too, too many bad things at him. But the bottom line to me in this contest is, in the Colts, you got a football team that's sitting here still alive in the National Football League playoff race. Uh, right now, the number one seed happens to be Detroit, but the Colts are number nine right now. And this is a big, huge football game for them. When you come off of an effort like Detroit did last week and then they have to pick it up and take out under the road here, you can oftentimes play down to the level of an opponent. And I think that's what we're going to see here. Detroit playing down to the level of the Colts. I like the Colts in this game. Andy, what do you see in this contest? Well, I don't know what's more remarkable. Um, we all know <laughs> Detroit's a great football team. OK, you would have think the uh, lines makers would have made adjustments beginning maybe around week four or five. The Detroit Lions, we know they're nine and one straight up. They had that week two loss at home to Tampa Bay. They're eight and two against the points. And one of those two losses was a half point uh, loss against uh, Houston a couple of Sundays ago uh, when they uh, won. What was it? Twenty three, twenty, I think, laying three and a half. So they could just as easily be you know, if they score if they score a. Um, a touchdown and win by four instead of a field goal, you know, that uh, would have given them a three that gave them a, th a three point win. Uh, they they cover that game. So it's remarkable. In fact, they are outscoring their opponents this year uh, by uh, 15 point nine points per game. To put that in perspective, the second best team is Buffalo, about five points lower, about 10.8. I mean, that's that's clear separation. That's not quite at the level of the 07 Patriots, but it's uh, certainly in the top five right behind them as far as that's done. Now, it is a bad situation for the Lions because it's a short week. They've got the Thanksgiving Day rematch with Green Bay coming up four days later. But considering how they've been able to put opponents away, I cannot bet against the Detroit Lions until they show some sort of struggle against a team. Now, they, now I said that Houston was a good football team that they, that they squeaked past. It was on the road. Indianapolis, what, the one thing they've done this year is they've been involved in basically all close games. I think their biggest loss this year was the 10-point loss at home to Buffalo a couple of weeks ago. Otherwise, I think every game has been a, a, a one-score game. Richardson looked okay last week, but he uh, faced one of those bottom feeders in the New York Jets. Well, people will say, well, well, look at the Jets' defense. Well, here's something about the Jets' defense. Since they fired Robert Sala and named the defensive coordinator the head coach, that defense is down considerably uh, oh, since uh, uh, when he no longer had the full-time responsibility of concentrating on the defense, and it's shown up in the numbers. Uh, so while I give Indianapolis credit for winning, especially the way they won, uh, I can't. I can't play Indianapolis in this in this game. I like Indianapolis. I played them in a lot of games. I had them last week against the Jets. Okay, but a lot of that had to do with the Jets being favored, and I still can't figure out why. But nonetheless, if I play the game, it would have to be Detroit, especially without the hook at seven. Uh, uh, let me ask you this, Greg. Uh, Detroit wins the yards last week. 
in that romp by 475 yards. I don't know if I've ever seen that before, uh, one team beating another National Football League team by 475 yards. It might have been before it was called the National Football League. I'm not quite sure about that. Can they do it again this week? What do you think, Greg? No, I, I kind of agree with uh, with Andy on this, actually. Um, even though I'm um, looking at it in the same way that you and, and Jim are, uh, which is probably why I'm not going to touch the game because if I would, I'd go with Andy. I, I just can't bet against Detroit right now. I just can't do it. Not against a team like the Colts, but um, but I, I also agree with the fact that you've got you got to figure. All right, you come off the, that that big win after he embarrassed himself on on, on national TV with the interceptions, and, and now they're happy again and rolling again. But when are they going to kind of take a little bit of a break mentally? Well, it would be this week because you've got the short week Thanksgiving Day in front of the nation. So they're going to be psyched up for that. The next week it's Green Bay. You're psyched up for that. The next week you got Buffalo. You're psyched up for that. So if they're going to be a week that they're just going to be a little bit off, you would think this would be the week. It's a road game. It's a lot of points. Colts can backdoor cover. So that's why I would stay away from it. But um, it is interesting that you mentioned, Andy, that Detroit's eight and two against the spread. I think a lot of people would be shocked to see the Colts at eight and three against the spread. Yeah. By the way, the one thing about Detroit, they may, that offense, they may just not be able to help themselves from not scoring. <laughs> not. I, I mean, you know, you talked about the Mark mentioned the, the yards the finish line. I don't know what the record is, but the Lions had 38 first downs in that game. No. That's got to be close to a record. <laughs> now you know why everybody wants their OC. So yeah, if 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 this if this was that easy, as, I mean I understand li liking Detroit in this spot, but if this was that easy, wouldn't this be a double digit favorite? I agree one hundred percent. I don't I don't I'm going to be on the bookmaker side here because I just think it looks too damn easy to have a seven point favorite. This should be 10, 11, 12 points if it's that easy. Yeah. When you look at it, well, why isn't I mean, can't why should why isn't it the same line that Kansas City over Panthers? I mean, it's yeah. They, uh, no, it just looks too damn easy to me. That's what the first comment I heard uh, when I did uh, another show was, "Why is this line so cheap?" Well, yeah. it, it, it's there well, for the a reason, not, guys. The Colts are not the Jacksonville Jags or Tennessee. I mean, the Colts are almost a 500 football team, and they almost made the playoffs last year with a lot of the same personnel. So, I don't know. I, I maybe teams think they're in the same division. They're they're looping them in with Jacksonville and Tennessee. So, thank you. I don't know what kind of point spread it's supposed to be. This is this is a 500 team. I mean, Detroit's playing great football, but how much you want to put in? It's an NFL. I I, I also think that 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 the Lions being this superpower NFL team is oh, such a new commodity you. that that plays into the line as well. I mean, these aren't the 49ers who surprised me have been a favorite every game this week, this season. It's not the Chiefs. This is the Detroit Lions that we just swallowed last year, rising to prominence. And now to make them a double digit team against an Indianapolis Colts squad that can play, I think is a little far fetched too. Oh, I agree. It's, it's slightly cheaper than I thought. It uh, are you, is there any particular reason, guys, uh, uh, Mark, that you can see why uh, Indianapolis has been good against the spread this year? I, I think it's a little bit to do with what you just said, Greg. They're not as bad as uh, as the record indicates, and I know they've had some ups and downs at the quarterback position here, uh, in and out, with, uh, especially with Richardson being out of the lineup here. But they're not as bad. They're not performing as bad or poorly on the field as I think the public perceives them to be. And I think the Vegas odds makers see that. They realize that this football team does have potential. I need to correct myself. They are currently the number eight seed in the AFC playoff race. So, uh, you know, they're awfully close to earning themselves a playoff spot. You remember the Lions were, what, one questionable coaching decision away from being in the Super Bowl last year with that, uh, you know, game one at uh, San Francisco. So this is, the, and by the way, Indianapolis, you, you, you're right, right? They were a nine and eight team last year and nobody really paid them much of an attention. I no. think they lost out on tiebreakers uh, for uh, the final wild card. Uh, uh, I, I am well, surprised. Running back, if, if, if the running back catches the ball out of the backfield, yeah, that's true. <laughs> you know, it's as simple as that. Yeah. The, 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 um, no, the, the the Colts are a, a capable football team. Yeah, it's just just it's just the line does seem short because you have to believe that uh, 
you know, like, like Jim said, it that you have to believe that everyone's going to just jump and say, "Hey, I only have to live." They j they've scored over fifty points a couple, of, you know, four games apart this year. Now some of them were, you know, the AFC South teams. Touchdowns. Yeah, well, that's also part of it. Well, where's the <laughs> where, where does Indianapolis play? <laughs> They're better than Jacksonville and Tennessee, however, and considerably yes. better. But no, Jim's right. It looks a little too easy because you have to believe the books are expecting tons of money to come in on the uh, on the, on the Lions. I mean, they they can't outscore the opponents by a by more than a touchdown in each half. You know, but you know what the strange thing is, guys, is Detroit's only going to play two outdoor yes. games this year. Uh, the actual, they, the line they played one so down. far. I'm sorry, Jim? Yeah. The line has actually come down. Yeah, what's yeah. that all about? Yes, I mean, it's just uh, the money, the sharps are taking the dog. It's, it's, it's that simple because the public's all over the favor. And, and there's no, obviously, Mark, you'd know it more than anybody. There's nothing historically that says that Detroit doesn't cover before Thanksgiving. No, I don't think Detroit looks uh, lays down before Thanksgiving. Uh, they kind of tend to lay down on Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, they, they like turkeys. So it can't right. be that before Campbell. Too, too, yes. too much turkey. Too, too much yes. trip to fit. <laughs> how, how about the big number? How about the fifties number? Is there anything? Uh, again, I guess not because you would have talked about it about any you know teams that come off you know big fifty point games. Do they uh, kind of come back and uh, not cover? Well, the, the, the first week? time the first time Detroit scored the fifty, they came back and won at Green Bay the following week. And that's the, what I was going to say. It's strange you think that there is a comeback off of a high scoring performance, but there's not. It's usually yeah. a, a, an indicator that the team is hitting on all cylinders. Is, Where there is, is a letdown is, is when it occurs like also three games a in a row. Division. This is also a non-division road favorite, which is not. This, I mean, it's a whole different animal when I have you have a division, division opponent up next. They, they have two division opponents up next behind this. Correct. So, right. Yeah. Right. That may be okay. part of the thinking. The, the the upcoming divisional opponents, the short week uh, before Thanksgiving, uh, those are all negatives for uh, for Detroit. But you know, so instead of winning by thirty. Maybe they win by twenty. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, it, but the, the line, the line does seem. Yeah, I mean, if if you would have asked me who the biggest double digit fav, biggest favorite this week have been, I don't know that I would have made Kansas City. The way that they've had trouble scoring and when winning by margins. The only thing about Kansas City is they are coming off of a loss, and you know they might say, "Hey, time to get serious, guys." Uh, well, you they, know, before we they start actually should have lost a couple of games this year. I mean, they lost. Yeah. They could have lost the Bengals. They could have lost the first yeah. game of the year to uh, Baltimore. The Ravens. They could have yeah. lost to Denver, yeah. and they they and they did. They actually could le legitimately have four losses. That they were they played that close to teams. They won three of them, they, but they did. I mean, they could have easily had four losses. Real quick, I would, I I would have thought. In. Andy, Andy, I'll just tell you on Jim Feist podcast today, I gave Mark Lawrence credit because at the beginning of the year, when Mark said the Chargers not only have a chance to make the playoffs. He thinks they could beat out Kansas City. And if Casey didn't have a few fluke wins, Mark would be right on the money. But he was high on Harbaugh, and I didn't think so. I think a lot of us Keenan were. Allen and Mike Williams. Well, they lost Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. Yeah. I didn't think they had any receivers. They also gone. lost Brandon Staley. Yeah, well, well that's, <laughs> that's worth you, three you go, no, right seriously, there. That's you, go, you go from one of the worst coaches of the last 25 years to one of the best. The uh, Chargers last year, I want to say they lost six or seven games by three points or less. You knew that at least half of those would be turned around into wins, and well, that's Mark been the Lawrence case. Mark Lawrence was the one. Lawrence was on the yep. Chargers. Absolutely. Well, and you've also got a generational quarterback there in Justin Herbert as well. Yeah. You, you unite him with the Harbaugh, put a little bit of a running game around that, and that's a real tough combination. I, I'd be curious what the, what the book's thinking was because I would have to think if they made the uh, Detroit Lions 10-point favorites in this game, I think it have a lot of people starting to say, you know what? That's a lot of points. Maybe I'll take the underdog, and yet you have some people say, oh, I don't care. It's the Lions. I'll lay the ten. But it's seven. So who, who be, Andy, Andy, let me ask you this: Who becomes the number one play in the Circus Survivor contest this week? Kansas City laying eleven on the road, or Detroit laying this number? Well, it, it really uh, depends, this coming it, it week really depends yeah. on who they have alive. Because exactly, like when I was talking to Paul this morning. There's so many teams that he used that he doesn't have anymore in the, in the survivor. You can only use one team 
throughout the whole year. That's so a great a lot point. Of people early yeah. that picked underdogs that won straight up are, are now have the ability to take a Kansas City where Paul used Kansas City earlier in the year, so he can't take them. So that's a, that's kind of a, a strange issue, but that that's the, the rules of the contest. That's well, why that's, that that's, fourth, that's one of the one of the, that's one the Cleveland of the, Browns last week. <laughs> well, that's one of the strategies is that you you know before the start of every season. There are going to be four or five teams that are going to surprise and be worse than you expect, and four or five teams that are going to surprise and be better than you expect. But you don't know who those teams are. But by the time you get to week seven or eight, you know who those teams are. And so there will be some teams that you expect to be bad, turn out to be good. You can play them later. The way Survivor is set up, it's almost like a chess game. You know when to to sacrifice your bishop and your knight, you know, as opposed to just sacrificing your pawns and trying to hold on to pieces. Anybody, it's it's really, it's why the people that play Survivor and get this far, they all have gray hair. <laughs> well, good for them. They deserve it. That's all I can tell you. It's, it's, Everybody it's that not, does deserves it. <laughs> hey, Greg, let's uh, let's put the wraps on the show if we may. I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah. With our little roundup of uh, questions you might have and answers that we might have right back at you. All right, before I get started, Jim, uh, how much time you have? You want me to give what? How much more time do you have? You, you want me to give one play because I probably should go. Well, my iPad is, and I'm in a restaurant, my iPad is going a little bit lazy. It looks like it's... Yeah, go ahead and uh, give us give us a play before we, you, uh, you okay, I'm gonna give you. Okay, I'm going to give you a play. I'm going to give you the Chicago Bears. To possibly win this game straight up. And I know it's a crazy play. You're going against Minnesota. Yeah. Darnold is a little banged up. He's not been feeling quite well. I'm not sure exactly what's wrong. But the Bears are going to give this division rival. It's a it's a it's it's a road favorite in division. I'm taking the dog plus the points in Chicago. You've got an indoor team playing outdoors. You never know with the weather because you can't get the weather effect there. It doesn't look like it's going to be bad, but you can't ever tell. It will be cold. And I'm going to take the Chicago Bears plus points and possibly win the game straight up. All right, Jim. I like it. I like the pick as well. Matter of fact, I interviewed uh, uh, Mark Carmen from Chicago uh, Sports Radio. And, uh, yeah, he says that their OC uh, looks like a good, a good pickup, uh, the new OC. And, um yeah, I think the Bears are – I think Minnesota is right for a uh, an upset as well. So I'm with you, Jim, and thanks a lot for taking the time at the restaurant to join us here for a few minutes. Okay, we'll see you next week. And everybody, if I don't talk to you, but have Thanksgiving, I think we will – I don't know, when, we're, when are we taping next week? Uh, well, well, I would love to make it Wednesday. I'm going to almost say it's going to be Friday here right now, Jim. I don't know how I'm going to do Thursday. But we could, you know what we could do? We could tape next week. I could get a bye week. And Greg can host. How's that sound? We could do it on Wednesday. Okay. You probably should have one because you're working 20 hours a day. Yeah. So. I self-imposed a buy for me next week. <laughs> All right. You're on. <laughs> and, Jim, and Jim, I got your uh, contest things. I'm going to put them in this afternoon. I just wanted to wait to make sure you weren't going to make any changes. Well, unfortunately, the, the contest is not – I've never been good in these contests. I mean, I, I was 17-3 and three Saturday and Sunday last week, but my contest picks were 3-2. and two. I mean, I don't know what – I don't know how that happens. Well, seventeen just, and three probably five. paid for the contest for the next five years. Well, believe me, the the money was the money was very good. I just matter of fact, I just picked up a little bit of a pe- part of that package today. So <laughs> you take word care, has it that Jim's negotiating to buy Dom DeMarco's. <laughs> I don't want to run. A it restaurant. was that good of a week. I can't I can't run one as well as Albert does. So I'm going to stick with being a customer. <laughs> All right, guys. Kenny, have a Thank great week. Guys. Thanks for hopping on board. We really appreciate it. And uh, you guys Thank soak you. up that pizza. Thank you. Bye bye. All right. Be well, guys. All right. So, Jim, uh, we'll see him again next week before Thanksgiving. And uh, let's go to Tony. Tony, uh, you're ready to give us your matter of fact. Let me go ahead and set the uh, the clock here. Uh, your one minute pick. So uh, let me know if you're ready to go. All right. Let's do it. All right. Let's do it, Tony. All right, so happy Thanksgiving to everybody coming up, and we know that the Harbaugh family will celebrate. I heard that there is a, a great little piece that they're doing. I don't know on what channel, if it's one of the streaming services or uh, on ESPN itself, but 
it's got the whole family and there's some good stories in there so that should be good uh this will be added to it i guess uh with the chargers hosting the ravens in a game that's big for both seven win teams obviously the harbaugh's have faced each other twice before most lately in the super bowl i think it was uh 13. Uh, but the first meeting, also a Baltimore Ravens win. John Harbaugh has led Jim Harbaugh or has been tied in every single game. So I think uh, Jim will get the lead this first half coming up. I like the Chargers first half plus a half a point against the Ravens on Monday night. That sounds like handicapping a Breeders' Cup race. Nice job there, Tony. I like that. I didn't realize he had the lead in every game. That's nice. Under a minute. Great job, Tony. All right, next up, let's go to Andy. Andy, what do you got for us? Are you ready to go? Is Andy on mute? That's the question. Yes, he is. Are you ready, Andy? <laughs> yes, I was trying to navigate my mouse to unmute. Okay. So here you while. go, Andy. Here, here's chasing your the cheese. Okay. Andy, that go. couldn't be your minute. You're down to 30 seconds. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll start it over again. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Andy. I've reset it. You're on. Okay, I'm going to go to college football, and I'm going to take a look at a game I sort of alluded to a little earlier, Arizona State and uh, BYU. It also seemed inevitable in recent weeks that BYU's perfect season would come to an abrupt end, and it did last week when they lost at home to uh, uh, to Kansas. Uh, he won't win the coach of the year, but uh, Dillingham of ASU will come in a close second to uh, Signetti. Uh, Arizona State, very surprisingly, 8-2 and two this year. They're 5-0 and oh at home, both straight up and against the spread. Unlike BYU, which opens its season uh, with a win over FCS Southern Illinois, currently a 3-8 and eight team, Arizona State has played only FBS teams. Uh, both of their losses were to Big Ten foes on the road, both ironically as five-and-a-half point uh, underdogs by eight and ten points. Against six common foes, BYU is 6-0 straight up, just 3-3 three and three against the spread. Arizona State is 5-1 and one straight up, 6-0 and oh against the spread. That's a pretty nice database from which to draw some conclusions uh, in a just a 12-game season. ASU has the better stats in those games, albeit by a slight margin. Both teams are plus 9 in the turnover margin. And where most of the games have been reasonably close in the stats, I like the way this Arizona State is playing. I've got them winning the game 30-17. to 17. All right. You are in big trouble. That went a minute and 20 seconds, Andy. So uh, no short for you this week. No. All right. Uh, but Andy was uh, spot on last week, Mark. Uh, now, did, when, by the way, did you did you stop it when I fumbled a little bit with the mouse? Oh, yeah. Okay. That would have been two minutes if we didn't reset. No. <laughs> uh, but Mark, uh, Andy, of course, uh, had that short last week. Uh, boy, did uh, Illinois kick Michigan State's ass. Uh and Michigan State had everything to play for. Illinois had nothing to play for except it was their home finale. And by the way, that's something also I know we didn't really touch up on, but hey, we're at that point of season in college football where you have to look at these little inspirational games. To, you know, maybe one team's playing for a bowl, uh, or maybe one team like Illinois last week is playing on uh, senior day. You know, Mark, I, ha I have a question for you related to that. Sure. And I, it's probably in your database, but I don't know if you've done the research or have it. And that is a team that has been bowling, say, for two, three, four consecutive years, suffers their sixth loss of the season and no longer is bowl eligible. And let's say the following game, they're playing someone other than, say, a traditional rival, you know, like uh, Arizona, Arizona State, uh, Ohio State, Michigan. How those teams, after their last possible goal of making it to a bowl game, has pretty much been wiped. Well, has been wiped out with that six loss. I cannot ask that specifically in my database, but it's a good logical question, and you would think that they're not going to show up a team that uh, was eliminated recently, especially if they're spoiled uh, by having been a bowl team yeah. before. It's I think it's sort of an e enormous, immense letdown type situation. But I'll play around with it a little bit, Andy, and maybe come back with you with an answer on that next week. I can toy around with it. All right, are you ready to go, Mark? Yes, I are. You're on. Okay, uh, I'm going to take a look. Uh, I'm going to stay inside the Big 12 Conference this week. Colorado, in control of their own destiny, playing host to Kansas this week. Kansas comes in here needing this game like a vampire needs blood. They need two wins in their last two games. They got one last week. But what I'm doing here more than anything else is playing against loudmouth Deion Sanders. <laughs> He's been bragging all week about you know how uh, he his 
players should be winning the Heisman Trophy this year. Maybe perhaps deservedly so. Uh, great two-way player, Travis Hunter. But he went on to brag about he should win every award possible. The Thorpe, the Bolitnikoff, the Jerry Rice, and he even said the Prime Award. Well, the Prime Award to him is the Deion Sanders Primetime Award. There is no Deion Sanders Primetime Award. It's a name that he made up, and he's only building himself up because he's taking advantage of a Heisman situation here. Too much hoop, too much holler coming out of Buffalo here. I like Lance Leopold, who does the work that he needs to do to win football games. I'll play him plus the points in the upset over Colorado. By the wow. way, my, if you remember, I think it was about seven, eight years ago, Miami of Ohio started 0-6, won their last six games to make it to a bowl game. Kansas, not quite as strong, as, as tough a, 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 a feat, but they were 3-6 and six entering last week's game against BYU. They might very well run the table. I like your pick, Mark. It also happens to be my uh, number, uh, my top pick in the Wise Guy contest this week. Very, so, and what did I, how did I do on time there, Greg? Not good for the first time. Not only did you go over, which you're used to going 20 seconds under, but you went about 15 seconds over. See, I hopped on Eddie's tail and I just continued the continue with the wave is what I did. I thought I thought you, you thought that the under is, the hate hate is what that was. Yes. <laughs> I thought that, that I thought that maybe Mark, you thought that the underage from last week carried over. I thought it may have and you but, used it this week. I, I can't help myself when I talk about Deion Sanders, guys. Uh, he just really gets under my skin. And uh, whenever I have an opportunity to kind of rail against him, I do that. And that's what put me over the number here. Uh, you can actually look for a video on uh, the Prime TV uh, channel that uh, Mark and Jim did last week, uh, where one of the questions, one of the segments did happen to be on Deion Sanders and whether or not yes. he would be the next head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. So uh, now there's is- talk here about the uh, Raiders. Possibly, well, I, uh, I think all that talk pick. is because the owner is infatuated uh, with Sanders, and they would which, say, which, well, which, you pick Sanders." Which, which owner, Mark Davis or Tom Brady? Mark Davis, yeah, Tom Brady. <laughs> you know, that, I tell you what, we haven't talked about Tom Brady much, uh, and and I'm just, you know, look, I'm not, I'm not a Patriot fan, but as a Michigan fan, um, I just, it's, it's always hard for me to root against him, even though he was in my division and beat the hell out of my team all those years. Always big on Tom Brady, made a lot of money for me, uh, money player. Uh, I just don't like it. It's like embarrassing when, when uh, you know, when you have everything, don't try to do something that's completely out of your neighborhood. And it's like, he's just, maybe he'll get better at it as a broadcaster, um, but he has a lot of work to do. I don't know how you what, guys feel about what, Brady. What's your, what's your review of Bill Belichick on the Manning cast? How's he doing? Uh, I haven't I haven't seen it yet. So he I thought I think he's done pretty well. I've heard he's, good things. He's, he's short answers, but they're very insightful. I think he still might be a head coach next year. Now I don't I have no idea if it would be with the with the Jets because of his relationship with Woody, but if Woody takes that job again with the Trump administration, maybe it opens the door for Bill Belichick to come coach the Jets, which uh, may not be the worst idea in the world. Well, that should be a time to get, w- walk away from the family. Didn't he just father a child with a real young looking babe, Bill Belichick? Father? A, oh, did he? Father a child. I knew he was yeah. da- dating a babe. I didn't realize yeah. he fathered a child. Wow. Okay. I wonder if some offshore book has odds up on if he coaches where it will be, because I could see Dallas being a uh, prime candidate. I agree. That wouldn't be okay. Especially if Dallas happens to work out a way to get the uh, the Sanders, uh, Sanders. prime prime I mean, or or Hunter, either one. That's where Parcells went. So if Parcells can do it, why can't Belichick? Um, I just want to wrap it up here with a few things. First of all, uh, there are three, as, as Mark mentioned at the beginning, there are only four games this week in the NFL where you have either a winning team or a team at 500 or better. Uh, the three winning team versus 500 teams, you got Green Bay, San Francisco, Seattle, Arizona, Philly, and the Rams. Eagles have won six straight, Rams four out of five. That's the Sunday night game. Seattle's beaten Arizona the last five times they've played. Uh, last time I checked, Arizona was a one-point favorite. I'm not sure if that's changed. Um, and Green Bay, San Francisco, uh, this is the first time the 49ers are a dog since the 2022 season. 
Uh, yep. We'll see how they react to being a dog. Let's keep in mind, San Francisco is just a banged up football team. Even the guys that have returned that are playing, Trent, Will Trent Williams, Christian McCaffrey, all these guys, Fred Warner, they're all banged up. Uh, and Green Bay is just definitely going to be high in this game. Uh, they have remember what happened in the playoffs. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and then as Jim said, he's got Chicago over uh, Minnesota as an upset. I'm actually going to, I don't know if they can pull off the upset, but I'm going to take Tennessee. I don't know what you guys think about that. I'm going to take Tennessee as a possible upset, but I like them uh, with the points and uh, taking a look at a couple of reasons why Houston just four eleven and one against the spread in their last 16 is a home favorite including one, two, and one in that spot this year. And they're also one and nine against the spread at home versus a losing team. Oh, and one in that spot this year. So I think there are some, uh, some stats there that say, I think Houston uh, might have a hard game this week, even though Tennessee is one and nine against the spread on the year, not the team that you want to be putting money. And, and on. are you Mark. considering the fact that they may, may be one of those teams that is quote unquote tanking? No, I actually, we spoke about this, Jim and I, and uh, maybe that's why Jim brought this up. We went over that. We were talking about teams like Dallas, uh, Jacksonville, those teams that just look like they've given up. But Tennessee, I think, is going to be one of those teams that's going to be the opposite. And I think one of the reasons is they got a new head coach that they believe in, that they're, they're definitely going to be looking to get better each week. Levis actually played pretty well last week, even though the numbers weren't big, but that's a very tough Minnesota defense. So I, I like the direction Tennessee's going, and I think they're going to – because remember, remember a lot of, some people actually thought Tennessee was going to be a lot better than people thought when the season began. But I think, I think what, 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 what they should have been thinking of is, well, maybe that'll happen, but that'll happen later in the year once the coaching staff, you know, gets uh, gets a little, you know, his feet wet with the system and everything, and and a young team. It's a very young team, so I think Tennessee might actually be a pretty good second half underdog to keep an eye on. I don't know if you guys have any uh, bad teams that you think actually might have a good second half. Uh, by the way, I agree with the Tennessee. I love their defense. I don't think they're they're built to quit. Uh, they're only building for the future here. My only question would be uh, Levis. Will Levis, yeah. uh, can, can he sustain uh, some sort of uh, consistency? But I like the makeup of the football team, especially the defense. And by the way, it's players do not tank. Management, coaching puts him in a position to possibly not play their best. Uh, you know, you mean like the Giants? Go play Tommy DeVito. Yeah, Tommy Cutlets. By the way, the one game that does have the two winning teams, I think we talked about, the Harbaugh Bowl, Baltimore and uh, – the Chargers, yeah. seven and four, seven and three. Great game. All right. Let's wrap this up by uh, talking about uh, the one. Actually, there were some comments uh, that we can get into, but what I want to talk about first, uh, we have a sports chat with Mark uh, from one of the coffee club emails this week. Uh, and it's uh, now, now this might be something that you guys, including Tony, might want to get into. Frank from Washington wanted an event. I was reading on Yahoo Sports that the NBA has a missing stars problem, and I would agree. During the opening weeks of the season, the league was besieged by absent stars, and he, you know, list the name of them. The list goes on. As a fan, I feel these overpaid, highly sport athletes are fleecing the fans who come to an arena to see them play, only to see them sitting on the bench in street clothes, or worse yet, nowhere to be seen. It's time Adam Silver stepped in and put the kibosh on this advantage taking. Mark says. I couldn't agree more, Frank. Star players are on pace to miss over 1,000 games this season, roughly 24% increase from last season. The hope is that this is just an early season blip, but there's reason to believe that the dark cloud hovering over the league is here to stay. I couldn't agree any more, Frank. Star players are on pace. Oh, that's just, uh, I guess, uh, it was said twice. Anyway, uh, Mark, I guess that's what was on your mind. What's on your mind about uh, responding to Frank, Tony? I'd say stop blaming the players because that's an organizational thing. Uh, it is a training staff thing. If you are not 100%, you are not allowed to play in many cases, and uh, that just is what it is. There are guys out there that would absolutely play, and there are guys that welcome the break. So uh, I think that's like every facet of society. Um, you know, There are guys that would kill to be out there that are basically shelved. So, again, don't blame it on the players. Obviously, the league, especially early, has this issue. Uh, you had uh, just this week 
Tyrese Maxey went at uh, Joel Embiid in a leaked message at, uh, from a players only meeting saying, hey, you got to be more on time. You got to be with it. That made news and Embiid has addressed that and said he has to be better. Uh, the 76ers not coincidentally now have uh, the worst record in the Eastern Conference and just lost Paul George to a hyperextended knee, which everybody saw happen on uh, on Wednesday night. So, again, there's some guys that just can't, can't stay healthy. There's just so many factors in it. Um, I think the, the product does, however, improve in December and in the, the new year. That's the case with the season every season, especially with an abbreviated preseason. The league starting earlier and earlier every season, it seems. This year it was October 20th or 21st. Uh, and, and the bottom line is we're starting to see much better games. I didn't bother to handicap after after the first week just because of the uh, increased different rotations and whatnot. But uh, I'm starting to I'm starting to see things more and more clearly. So that that'll help. Well, what would we have done, guys? Uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers got off to that tremendous start. They had won 13 or 14 in a row, and it was Donovan Mitchell's turn to take a blow, take a day of rest on a 13 or 14 game win streak. What if the Cavs have lost that game, their streak had blown? How much controversy would there have been after him sitting out voluntarily taking a little bit of rest? Well, look, they, they, they got to 15 and 0 and in game 15 or game 16 against the Celtics, they did not have Karis LeVert, their top six man who win that award right now, who leads the entire NBA in plus minus Dean Wade sat, um, Isaac Okoro, one of their starting five, their top defender, also not capable of playing in that game. And again, would you love to have a full house in an NBA Cup game against the Boston Celtics on the road? Yes. But again, that comes down mandate GM training wise. You're not 100%. You're not playing, not this early in the season. Well, one thing that the NBA did a few years ago is, as I recall, I forget, I think they said in order to be eligible, like for some uh, MVP awards and things like that, a player cannot, uh, must play at least, I think, 65 games or something uh, to be eligible. So that was sort of an attempt. You know, basketball, despite, you know, the the hard hitting in football, I would maintain that basketball, especially at the NBA level, is the hardest game on the athlete because they're running up and down, putting 250 pounds of pressure on their legs every time they take a step, you know, running up and down the court. And that takes a toll, you know, especially like on the knees and some of the other joints. Uh, so I can understand. And I think Pop was the one who started this years ago with Tim Duncan and, uh, you know, the Spurs and everybody mm-hmm. caught on because really the thing is that, you know, you're playing to get into the playoffs and you want to be at your peak Uh, performance level when the playoffs start and I think giving athletes some sort of rest. Now, you go back 100 years, you know, or 60 years, 80 years, whatever, Joe DiMaggio, they they asked him once, why are you always playing so hard and rarely take time off? He says, because there may be someone at the park today who's never seen me play before. And that's true because there are always new fans coming in. You know, we've been at it for years and decades, but there's someone today who's going to watch his first basketball game and probably more than just one person. So uh, that is a consideration, but the bottom line is the ultimate goal is winning championships and if a team if, if organization coaching staff whatever feels that it's in the best interest of the team and i can certainly understand it you want to give your players off the nba took another step in that direction by reducing the number uh, of back-to-back games especially if you're traveling from one city to the next about three four years ago to try and avoid but there's still situations that suggest that these players do need to play you know unless you want to extend the season for a month uh, and I don't know that people are talking about that, uh, that even 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 three games in five nights in three different cities can be taxing. Yeah, I think uh, hockey players might uh, feel that they should be in that grouping as well because uh, they got to hit each other. I know Mark likes yeah. hockey. He's got his Florida Panthers uh, championship T-shirt somewhere. Yeah, well, they don't hit each other like they used to hit each other in the days past. You know, they check. 40 house them. time. Yeah, right. Exactly right. Uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a lot cleaner game now, a lot more fun to watch right now. I grew up uh, looking for brawls in hockey games. <laughs> yeah. As a youngster, you know, it was, it was hard going to a hockey game. Let's drop those gloves and get it on. But yeah. you don't see that anymore. And I think I, I love those, a better game. I love that three and three on three overtime. 
Well, it's going to usually decide a winner. You know, sometimes yeah. the rare occasion you'll get uh, the overtime tie, but uh, it's, it's better than the shootout. I yeah. can't even watch the shootout. Like when the overtime is over, I could care less. It's like a three it's, point contest, three point shooting contest on ice with skates. Yeah, it's it's just it's it's not good. Um, uh, quickly, I uh, just wanted to also note that, uh, and and maybe we'll also talk about this because Mark and I we're going to do our college football uh, video. You can find that over on the Our Lads Football Channel, and uh, we're going to go through each conference in college football, uh, update everything going on, bowls, uh, playoffs, and so forth. But um, we'll leave with this college football uh, trend, and uh, it says. And, and of course, I got this out of the uh, Playbook magazine that Arkansas State is 14 and 0 straight up and against the spread in their last 14 games against Louisiana Monroe. So, uh, Louisiana Monroe, by the way, uh, this is going to be their fifth straight attempt to go bowling for only the second time in their history. They were 5 and 1, they're now 5 and 5. And their next game, if they don't win this one, is against Louisiana, their in-state rivals, who just happen to be maybe the best team in the conference. So uh, I just I don't know if I can imagine that. You're a ULM fan. You're five and one. We're gonna go bowling for the first time since 2012. We never won a bowl game ever. We're gonna do it. And now four games later, you're sweating bullets. And you got to try to beat a team that you haven't beaten in the last 14 games. Sounds like a Nebraska you- scenario there. Trying I wonder to become, what the odds were winning season. on Lafayette when they were five on uh, Monroe when they were five and one. What what you would have had to lay for them to not make a bowl game? Yeah, and yeah, I, d- I know they had some issues a few weeks ago, and I wonder if this has played into it a little bit with the coach. They had that coach uh, that uh, I don't know if it, he, he like called out a player or something like that, and he wind up leaving the team. It was a it was it was an yeah. ugly situation. Uh, that definitely could have been a distraction. Might have come into play even before. Uh, it was heard uh, that, you know, what went on there. So who knows? But uh, that would be too bad if that was the case. Uh, uh, I said this last week, Randy uh, Paw 6281. Uh, maybe I'll just bring this up every week because I know Andy likes to do them. Uh, Randy uh, wanted to know about teaser picks. So, Andy, do you have a teaser pick for Randy this week? Uh, let me uh, give me a uh, go on to the next comment. I'll take a look at that for a moment. You're in the last comment. Oh. Uh, but go ahead and, and, and give you another minute as uh, as we wrap it up by Mark uh, letting everybody know about how they can uh, get the Coffee Club email. Sure. just uh, That's a free bonus to anybody that subscribes to any of our playbook or my services at playbooksports.com. You subscribe for the length of your subscription or your service. I'll send you the Coffee Club e-letter in your inbox every morning once it, once over the weekends. It's there at 6 a.m. Eastern. It's a good way to start your day. And uh, one other thought, Greg, before I turn it back to you, Victor King couldn't join us today, but I want to remind listeners out there, you have to get the totals tip sheet also downloaded at Playbook Sports in time for the weekend this weekend if you're going to be serious about betting over under totals. Especially next week would be a great week because it's Thanksgiving week and uh, everybody wants to have some sort of action on Thanksgiving. And then there's a Friday. Is there, is there one or two games on Friday? I know the Las Vegas plays the Raiders, the Raiders play the chiefs on Friday, I believe. I think and, that's the uh, only game that, that day, there were three on Thursday okay. and a ton of college football. Games college. On there you go. Yeah. So next week's going to be pretty awesome for football fans. I don't know. Mark is going to be heavily invested uh, in the newsletter, which is why if you see that couch uh, behind Mark, <laughs> as soon as we uh, close off, uh, he'll be uh, resting uh, right there, and uh, and Colleen is going to go ahead and play the piano. Yes, she will. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wonderfully, too, by the way. Wonderfully. Yeah. <laughs> you got the teaser for us before we close off, Andy? Well, I think one team I would put in there would be the Dolphins, basically just to uh, win straight up against the That's uh, a good one. Patriots. Especially, especially, I like this Dolphins team down the stretch. They could easily be on a four-game winning streak. Remember, they had that uh, those tough late losses at Buffalo and uh, then against uh, the Cardinals before winning the last two games against the, at the Rams and then uh, last week's uh, nice win. So I, I look for good things out of them. I might uh, do a similar line, uh, the Texans. I know you like the Titans plus the points, but I still think Houston is good enough, especially as a playoff caliber team, uh, to uh, win the game outright against a uh, divisional foe. And if I was looking for one more team to put in there, 
I do like the Ravens this week to win the game, but I like the do- the and, and the cover. But I think the Chargers are defensively stout enough, although they've you know they had troubles in the second half against Cincinnati, and you know Baltimore's offense is just as good. But the way Harbaugh coaches and and, and plays the game, I could see moving from uh, plus three to plus nine, plus nine and a half with the Chargers. And you could always, if if you do play that in the teaser, uh, you could always come back if the first two legs hit. And make a little play on the Ravens and get yourself a six or seven point middle, uh, you know, straight play on the Ravens to do that. There you go. A little betting strategy there from Andy. Tony, uh, that's going to wrap it up, Mark. Okay, guys, I want to thank everybody out there for listening. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you will. We're getting close to that 1,000 subscriber total. You do us a favor, do yourself a favor, hit that subscribe button if you will. For our panel of experts on the show, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com, Tony Mejia, Playbook Experts and Contributor to the Sporting News, and our producer extraordinaire, Greg De Palma. Until next week, we'll be back on Wednesday when Greg takes the wheel. This is Mark Lawrence reminding you to always remember to bet with your head, not over it, and good luck as always.